For more on the dollar's performance, I'm joined by John Herman, the director of U.S. rate strategies at Mitsubishi UFJ Securities. John, always good to have you sure. on the show. It's great to be back. Thank you for joining us. John, yes. the dollar is up 10% year-to-date yes. against the euro. Yes. Is it that the U.S. economy is just uh, the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry <laughs> hamper? Is, is the, are the fundamentals behind the U.S. economy warranting it, or is that things in the eurozone are just looking so bleak I or think, both i think i think the thing is um uh, what we have i think the main driver bet between the euro and the dollar is that the ecb is embarked on a path of unprecedented easing and is likely to stay accommodative for the next couple of years whereas the u.s economy as you're mentioning is gathering some momentum and jobs look very forceful. And so the Fed, most likely this year, next year, will probably have to hike interest rates. And that's the main driver. It's that differential between tightness of monetary policy from the U.S. and more accommodative uh, policy in the Eurozone. Well, of course, if the Fed increases uh, the interest rate and tightens policy, that's going to push the dollar up even further. That will do. That will have that effect. But it won't, as we were discussing before, it, it won't quite be a straight line that some people are suggesting and a rapid run to parity and a breakthrough parity. Most likely, you know, the Fed is going to be very cautious because they're even highlighting today, some of the Fed speakers were highlighting, take concerns over the strength of the dollar. Is that something that they're taking into consideration when thinking about raising interest rates. How much of a factor is the strong dollar? Is what they're doing is they're being very creative and coy about the whole thing. And what they're doing is, uh, on the one hand, they're, they're telling people they're happy with the improvement that they're seeing in the U.S. But on the other hand, concerns about the strength of the dollar could make them slow the pace. So it's a two-way game. Well, let's talk about why the strong dollar is not always such a good thing. For, for, for example, yes. we have... Um, 30% of S&P 500 companies, according to Fortune, get more than half of their revenue from overseas. Correct. Why could a strong dollar be bad news for them? Well, for those, uh, what we see as, as Apple and other companies are suggesting, when they make their profits at overseas and they have to bring them back into U.S. dollars, they are converting them on an unfavorable basis because the dollar is strengthening and those currencies are weaker. So the profits, they have to give profit downgrades. And that's what we saw in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of that also in the first quarter. And we'll see and, those and results And the markets soon. are pricing this in for and the, the next earnings report. In. They're concerned and about I think, that. And I think the FX traders appear to me, when I look at uh, you know, views on the Fed, whether it's in fixed income markets that I work in or equities or FX traders, the FX traders seem to be the most aggressive in pricing in this differential between U.S. tight monetary policy and the accommodative abroad. But, John, if you're buying in dollars, doesn't that allow some U.S. companies to buy cheaper uh, materials overseas, for example? Yes. Can't that reduce costs? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a two-way flow to this. Uh, you know, the companies that you're saying who sell a good chunk of, or generate a big chunk of their revenues overseas, they're having to do revenue downgrades. On the other hand, the companies that are more domiciled and more domestically focused are able to pay lower for import, uh, input prices, and they're benefiting. Does the expensive dollar now increase the pressure for U.S. companies to outsource? I, you, that is a very, very good question. I think over the years we'll see the answer to that. But I will say this. Because you know, that would then come back. Come back to and hurt the, and US, hurt the economy. US economy. But I think the thing is, like we're saying, we don't think it's going to be really a straight line. That's the first thing. And the second thing is don't quite count out Europe and the rest of the world. Because what we're seeing in Europe, for example, the German economy is, is gathering momentum. Confidence is rising there, both in the consumer sector and the business sector. And their growth is almost as good as US growth. Well, John, one of the big question marks hanging over Europe is this whole situation with Greece. There is still no conclusion yeah. whatsoever. That must be impacting the euro. A so Brexit, that weighs, a Greek exit, exactly. is hovering. Exactly. Should that happen, would we see parity then? Or I, an even further decline? Maybe, you know, if, if there was a messy resolution to the Greece or a Greek exit, as you're saying, you could probably break parity and go below parity, which would be very unfortunate in, in, for the entire world system. Well, the dollar right now, $1.09 to the euro. What is your projection? Uh, you know, near our, 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 our near-term projection... Should I be booking a trip to Europe, John? Uh, I'll just say this. I just came back from overseas, and I, I came back from uh, Japan just very recently, and I was astonished at uh, how low the prices were on luxury goods uh, overseas. Uh, on the flip side, does this deter tourism in the U.S.? 
what it does is it really incentivizes americans to travel abroad because that's something that we have not been doing for the last five but or six are, years are, are other people not coming you, to visit i think the what you'll see you think i think what you'll see friends? you'll see a little you'll see some moderation uh, you know the european tourists who used to flood over here during the holidays and so on i still see them but uh, not quite as much as i, I John, used to see them there was talk that the dollar status as the global reserve currency could be under threat a couple of a couple months of, ago a couple of years, years ago. ago yeah is the dollar over that crisis? I think the dollar and, and, is. And what position does this put their renminbi in? Okay, so this was a really good. Uh, this is a really good question. If you went back in uh, like 2012, 2011, 12, and 13, when the U.S. was still struggling to uh, gain its feet underneath it, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk that the euro would replace the dollar mm -hmm. as the world's reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as we saw, you know, Europe hasn't quite. Europe's problems are probably more challenging than America because we are a unified country. We have a unified banking system, unified fiscal system, and uh, even despite all the fights politically, we are basically a unified country. Uh, the same cannot be said of Europe, and so they have more challenges. So the U.S. is the really the de facto reserve currency, and I, and I don't think that's a challenge, and that's probably a, a benefit for, as you're saying, why the, why the dollar would appreciate further against lots of other currencies around the world. Well, it would be interesting to see how the renminbi stacks up against the dollar. You know, it's. I think this is uh, something to to follow closely. Uh, they are trying. China's trying to manage, uh, you know, its currency and not allow it to weaken aggressively. But China is in a. a diff, you know, China is a is still an export driven right. nation, and uh, you know it would benefit. Uh, but we'll see how this plays out because again, uh, you know, uh, growth in Europe uh, is gaining a little bit of traction here. So don't be too pessimistic on Europe. That's what I would say. Okay. All right. John Herman, thank you so much. Director of U.S. Rate Strategies at Mitsubishi UFJ Securities.